welcome back. I had noticed some names from the last time. And before I start and get rid of my stuff on the screen, I just want to show you how big a black bear paw is. So you can't really see the definition of it, but you can see how big it is in relation to my hand. So full grown adult, pr pretty big uh, in the skull. It's pretty big too. <laughs> so this is like a reasonably medium sized adult. So you see it up to my head, it's pretty big. So, you know, they are considerably big, you know, they're the biggest wild creatures that we have here in Connecticut. So, all right, I'm just gonna get my video out of the way because I don't like looking at myself while I talk to you guys. So, uh, all right, so black bears in Connecticut. Um, Traditionally, uh, our black bear population has been up in the northwestern corner. Uh, there is uh, migration out to the Danbury area. Obviously, it's getting more uh, prevalent there. And they've even started going down to the Gold Coast in Fairfield County, where we'd rather not have them because, you know, the traffic is very challenging uh, for these animals, uh, especially when they're attracted to food cards and stuff. So uh, here we go. So this. This black bear was in my yard. I'm surrounded on three sides by People's State Forest. And this is the most beautiful black bear I've ever seen. I call him Valentino because he was so beautiful. But if you're young, you might not know why I use the word Valentino. But anyway, uh, this you'll see the differences in all our black bears. Generally, our black bears are black. Uh, as you go to different parts of the country, sometimes they have brown colorings. Uh, like I grew up in Texas and I had brown hair but it would bleach out in the summer because the sun's stronger. So that is true with the animals somewhat uh, as well. Um, this is a very good uh, graphic for our black bears, which are what we call ex-urban, which means they do tolerate a certain amount of civilization. Uh, Barry Lopez was a great nature essayist. And I really like this quote because it really kind of uh, encapsulates what our wildlife is here in Connecticut. One of the great dreams of man must be to find some place between the extremes of nature and civilization where it is possible to live without regret. And what that means is that where we can coexist with these different animal species and not regret uh, our behavior that might have impacted uh, them uh, negatively. And that applies to our environment as well. Um, as you know, probably you've heard my talks, I like literature. Uh, John Muir was a Scotsman who came to the United States and helped found our national park system. Uh, he says this, he said, in my first interview with the Sierra bear, we were frightened and embarrassed, both of us, but the bear's behavior was better than mine. After studying his appearance as he stood at rest, I rushed towards him to frighten him that I might steady his gait and run it. Of course, he was doing all the wrong things, but anyway, but contrary to all I had heard about the shyness of bears, he did not run at all. When I stopped short within a few steps of in, as he held his ground in a fighting attitude, my mistake was monstrously plain. I was then put on my good behavior and never afterward forgot the right manners of the wilderness. And this also encapsulates something, a behavior that we need to know about most wild animals and particularly black bears. Uh, they respect boundaries. Uh, if you see a black bear, we'll talk about this later, you just kind of stand there. You can even say, hey bear and you see what it's up to. And uh, generally speaking, a black bear is usually timid. They do have what's called a bluster where they'll stomp their feet on the ground, their front feet, and then kind of make a lunge of about a yard, but they always stop. But, you know, if you see like a 400 pound animal doing that at you, <laughs> your instinct's gonna be to turn and run, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, this is a young yearling bear standing up. Uh, black bears, unlike grizzlies, when they stand up is just to get a better look at things. They're curious. It is not a defensive posture. So that was a young yearling in the back of my property. Uh, bears of the world. Uh, these are the bears that we have uh, around the world, as you can see. Uh, there are eight species of bears. And only two of these species, the black bear and the grizzly uh, or brown bear, have stable populations. Uh, the black bear has the largest population throughout the North America. Uh, three of the world's eight bear species live in North America, the black, the grizzly, and polar bears. Uh, black bears are found throughout North America. Uh, it ranges from Canada to Mexico. 
uh, in lifts predominantly though it prefers forests and it feeds on fruits, nuts, shoots, and vegetation. Uh, across their entire range in North America, there's uh, supposedly a population of around 800,000. There are about 55,000 gris grizzly bears located throughout North America, but 30,000 of those are found in Alaska, and that's typical of our bald eagles as well. Only around 1,500 remain in the lower 48, and that's mostly west of uh, the Rockies. Um, Polar bears, there are only 26 to 31,000 remaining in the whole world. And with global warming, their numbers are dwindling rapidly. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen the Asian black bear called the moon bear. Uh, there's the sun bear. Uh, of course, the panda is probably uh, what we call a charismatic uh, me megafauna. And that is what all the bears are and larger animals. Um, so just that even though we don't have grizzlies, I know a lot of you travel, so I think it's important to show you kind of the difference. Uh, grizzlies tend to live in more open areas, while black bears prefer, as I said, uh, forested regions. But there is some overlap between the two. Uh, if a grizzly bear and a black bear get, were to get into a fight, you should definitely be putting your money on the grizzly, though. They are significantly larger, as you can see by these photos, uh, more powerful, more aggressive. Uh, the black bear, when it senses like, you know, it might be the end for it, it might put up a great fight, but it's not going to win. Uh, you can see the grizzly is really known for that shoulder hump. Uh, it's just a mass of muscle. Uh, they have very short, round ears to their body. Uh, their face has a little dish in profile, almost kind of like some of our owls have those dish faces. It has really long claws. Uh, and as you can see, the, it doesn't generally climb trees. It can climb a tree, but it doesn't use trees for protection or anything, because why would it? It doesn't have to. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, the black bear profile is, is quite different from that of a grizzly. Um, the, again, you can see that prominent hump on the grizzlies. The black bear and the polar bear do not have it. Occasionally, I've seen some black bears that have a little hump there, but it's not, you know, if you felt it, it would just be mushed down into fur, probably. Uh, with the grizzly also, as you can see, their rump is lower, uh, and um, the rump is higher on the black bears. So polar bears can weigh up to 1,500 pounds. They're really pretty, pretty big and pretty gnarly. You don't really want to encounter one of them. They're even more gnarly than the grizzly. Uh, uh, the um, length of them can be up to eight and a half feet high when it's standing on its feet, whereas gri grizzlies uh, can be up to um, seven to ten feet high. So grizzlies are, are very tall, but not quite as uh, ferocious as the polar bears. Uh, here's a pretty good map that shows you the range of all the bears. The gray is the black bear. So you see it really does cling to more uh, for uh, forested and less arid regions. There has been a movement of black bear back into Arkansas. You can see it's kind of up to the northeast corner of Texas there. There is a, a black bear species called the Louisiana bear and the Florida bears. Um, but generally speaking, they'll be clinging to the forests of those states. Uh, the grizzly, you can see very little slip of them, you know, into Montana. I was on a grizzly research mission in 2013 uh, in southern Montana, and we were trying to determine if the grizzlies were migrating from there up to Glacier National Park at the time. We had no evidence of that, but now they have moved up there. Uh, you can see the polar bears are, you know, in the white there. Uh, and then you can see some of the crossovers. So, uh, and the places with no bear population. That doesn't mean they might not have a vagrant animal mi migrating through, but generally speaking, those light uh, gray areas would not have populations of bear. So um, I always love to look at this, uh, this comparison. Bears evolved 40 million years ago. The largest bear ever was Arctotus simp, which is on the top right here. Uh, it was called a giant short-faced bear. And uh, you wouldn't want to run into it. It was 2,200 pounds, and it could run up to 50 miles per hour. I can't even imagine something that big running that fast, except for an automobile. Uh, it did disappear 12,000 years ago. 
and it stood over 11 and a half feet tall. So uh, quite the uh, quite the animal there. And you can see the comparison to a person, uh, 5'10", uh, our, our toad is standing that tall over. So I bet we're glad they were gone by the time we got here. Uh, that's not changing. Hold on. So a bear is a mythical creature. It's uh, black bears are much maligned. They're, they're, uh, people merge their behaviors with um, the grizzly bears. Um, and we'll learn about what, why that isn't true. But people think they're a dangerous predator, bloodthirsty. They're going to eat everything in your yard. And they're lying in wait for unsuspecting hikers. Uh, I chose this photo I took because it, it made me think there's fire coming out of, out of the bear's uh, uh, mouth, but actually that's a dead branch, but it illustrated what I was trying to say. Uh, are there also people consider them uh, as cuddly, often lazy creatures who laugh, sing, and play with us? And as you can see, uh, I'm sure you, a lot of you know the Berenstein Bears and then just cuddly teddy bears. Most people had a teddy bear growing up. I, I grew up riding horses and on a ranch, but I had a camel, go figure, for my stuffed animal. So, um, so how much of you had, many of you probably had a stuffed bear, but did you ever wonder how it got its name? Uh, well, we have to go to Teddy Roosevelt to find that out. He was an avid hunter and conservationist, also a big mover in the national park system. Um, he did uh, love to hunt wild animals in the wilderness, um, but one, one trip he took didn't result in a single trophy. Uh, he'd had a particularly rough year in office in 1902, so he decided he needed a vacation, and the governor of Mississippi was a friend of his, and he said, asked him if he could go down there and, and uh, hunt for black bear. So the governor, of course, was happy to have him, so he took him out hunting. And they didn't even see a bear, you know, and it was hot and he was out, you know, thrashing around in the woods. So he was really tired, exasperated, ready to go back to Washington. But his governor friend implored him to stay and asked him to meet him at a specific spot in the woods where the scouts promised they would produce a bear. Uh, so when Roosevelt arrived, he found a bloodied, agitated bear tied to a tree and learned that the scouts had chased the uh, bear with dogs and run it down until it was tired and then tied it to the tree for the president to shoot. But of course, he was a sportsman and he said he would not kill a tied, you know, harassed bear. Uh, so uh, this Washington Post cartoonist Clifford Berryman heard about this. So he drew an illustration and instead of depicting the older bear that they had chased, he depicted it as a cub and uh, depicted it as a baby bear and said that Roosevelt drew the line at shooting a cute baby bear. So it became so popular that anytime Berryman, who at the time was one of the top um, political cartoonists in the country, he would always put that little bear in the picture and he called it Teddy Bear. So that's how he got the name Teddy Bear. But this was so, so well publicized that this very well-known toy store in Brooklyn uh, decided that they would make a little teddy bear. So they uh, made the, the wife Rose, their last name was Mitchtum. Uh, she sewed a small plush bear and they, out of velvet and they put it in their window. And to their surprise, hundreds of people wanted to purchase this stuffed animal. And, but before they sell it in, you know, in deference to the president, they asked him if that was okay. So they mailed the original bear to him and he said, that's fine as long as you give some to me for my grandkids. So uh, the popularity of this bear uh, was late and short. It used to be called Teddy's Bear. They shortened it to Teddy Bear. And then the Mitchums stopped selling any other toys because they could make enough money selling the Teddy Bear. So uh, many societies throughout the world believe that bear is the ancestor of humans. Uh, Again, it was discovered over 40 million years ago. Uh, it's been honored for more in all cultures for more than 10,000 years. It's inspired the naming of two constellations. I'm sure we all know Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. They revolve around the pole star. 
Uh, the bears figure prominently in the mythology of almost every Native American tribe. You'll see them on many totem poles. Uh, the bear is considered a medicine being uh, that has impressive magical powers, and it plays a major role in many Native American religious ceremonies. They also, to the Native Americans, are symbols of strength and wisdom and are often associated with healing and medicine. Uh, one reason they think this is so is because bears continue fighting after they're seriously injured. Uh, and they, uh, but the Native Americans also believe they were capable of healing their wounds. And one thing that is interesting about bears, they are very, very rugged individuals. They don't tend to get infection. Uh, they're very res resistant to a lot of diseases. So in some degree, the Native Americans were accurate. Uh, they also strongly associated uh, humans uh, and bear because the bear do walk on their hind legs. But again, I can't uh, stress the, the importance to many of the tribes in America. They had to have permission to hunt the bears because they were so revered. And once they killed the bears and got whatever their, ever parts they needed, whether it's the fur, the claws, or, or whatever, uh, the dead body would all be, always be handled in a special ceremony and buried with great respect. So, so in the center, we have two flags in our country that have bears in them. Uh, one is the California state flag, which we see on a lot of t-shirts, uh, very popular, it portrays strength. Uh, this grizzly. Uh, when the Missouri state flag was adopted in 1913, they took their state seal and put it in the center of the flag. And on both sides of the center circle, the bear is there and it represents strength and bravery. But it's interesting because hunting in the 1800s nearly wiped out Missouri's black bear population. Uh, but genetic research does show that a small number of black bears are coming back to the Ozarks, including, as I said, into Arkansas. And the numbers have grown to over 800 over the last uh, decade. So they are coming back. Um, the, the bear is a symbol in Berlin. If you've ever been there, you'll see it all over the city and has been since the 13th century. Uh, a great experiment is going on in the UK now. Uh, they is thought that the, the bears became extinct in there during the early medieval period around 1500 years ago. Uh, I go hiking in Scotland a lot and I don't like tourist things. So I go to the out of the way castles, some of the ones that are more out in the country and almost everyone had some stuffed black bears that were hunted many, many years ago. Uh, they had wolves back then as well, uh, but they were, uh, killed out pretty much by the 16th century and um, but now the british zoological society is doing experiment in bristol england they have created a place called bear woods and they have some eurasian bears there as well as they're going to put eurasian wolves so that people can see uh, what these animals look like in their habitats so as you know, if in some of my talks, I've probably said this, when the colonists came, um, they built their settlements and farms. Uh, we were 90% forested or almost 95% in Connecticut. And they cut most of the trees down, used them for buildings, sending them over for masts and furniture to Britain. And it helped that and the beaver uh, trade helped really fund the colonies for a long time. But as they did this, by the 1840s, New England forests had been stripped of trees. Uh, and so a lot of the wildlife that rely on forests, like the bears, mountain lions, wolves, even turkeys, declined sharply, not only because their habitat had shrunk, but also because these predators were shot uh, by the colonists. So, um, so one of my favorite quotes, uh, Henry David Thoreau in 1845, when he went to Walden Pond, it wasn't like it was he remembered when he was a child. He said, I cannot but feel as if I lived in a tamed and as it were emasculated country. Is it not a maimed and imperfect nature that I am conversant with? Thank God they cannot cut down the clouds. So that's one of my favorite quotes. But today, bears have returned to our forest because of growth of forest land. Uh, as our farmlands became fallow in the mid 1800s and a lot of the farming industry went out west. Uh, and I recently found this out, but when Civil War veterans from the north 
were given land out west after they finished fighting. So a lot of their families moved out there. But anyway, our forests have rebounded to over 60% now in Connecticut. And uh, New England has the largest amount of forest land of any region in the country. Now that is done per capita, you know, by the size of the state. So, uh, you know, obviously uh, Oregon has a lot more, uh, you know, trees than we do, you know, the Pacific Northwest, but they do it by size. So uh, this is an old chart, but hold on. Uh, this is an old chart, but it'll give you some idea of the forest, how heavily forested we were in the 1600s and then up to 2000. Uh, we are losing some forests now and not because deep is cutting forests. Mostly they're cutting forests not to make money, but to create new habitats. Uh, there's a lot of wildlife species uh, like the woodcock. Uh, uh, and some small songbirds and the New England cottontail that really depend on that kind of brushland uh, land. So they're trying to make a little more diversity of habitat. Um, again, so um, I said that about New England and the black bear, like this one pictured here, which is in People's State Forest, they do really prefer the forested areas. Um, the growth has been steady uh, uh, of our black bears um, at the rate of about seven to eight percent per year. Um, and uh, but we have about 80 over 80 black bears hit by cars every year. So that knocks that percentage down somewhat. But you can see here uh, these are sightings. Now sightings are the deep ask if you see a black bear to go on their website and do a bear uh, sighting report. It's not getting the bear in trouble. It's simply giving them indicators of movements where the bears are moving to. Obviously, if you live in a ha in a neighborhood of 40 houses and all of a sudden you're, there's been like, you know, hundreds of bears seen in your neighborhood or area, that's likely the same number of individuals that everybody's counting, you know, but, uh, the biologists do take these numbers and they take other more hard data and uh, that's how they can come to the populations. Uh, so, uh, and with the number of bears, obviously, because we are such a heavily fragmented state, uh, we're very fragmented by roads and buildings, uh, there are some conflicts. So conflicts are also largely caused mostly more of the conflicts we have than not are caused by people that feed birds year round, people who don't secure their garbage and uh, people that don't uh, compost uh, correctly. Um, so generally those are the conflicts more than anything, but as you can see, they have just catapulted and some of the reason for the high number of conflicts, um, you know, in the, 2020 is when COVID came around, there were more people at home. And uh, some of those conflicts, a lot of those conflicts that are called in aren't really conflicts. They're just a bear crossing in somebody's yard. So uh, anyway, there's something in the animal kingdom uh, that's called carrying capacity. And it's like the ma maximum numbers of organisms of a species that can be supported in a given environment. So our carrying capacity would be what Connecticut can handle for the number of black bears, but there also is a cultural carrying capacity, which is the maximum number of individuals of a species that the human population will tolerate. And as we're seeing the bears move more into suburban and urban areas, there's a lot less tolerance. Uh, there's been a lot of to intolerance from people who have moved here from other states since COVID. Uh, you know, certainly they must have known that we do have some wild animals, but we are a state of about uh, 3.6 million acres and we're over 3 million people. So uh, we are very heavily populated, even though those high populations that are in uh, po pockets, was it? Per participants can see my application. Did you, are you guys just seeing my PowerPoint now? I just got a weird message, so. Uh, Okay. Uh, I, we can see it. You don't see anything else, right? No, just okay. the... Uh, okay, that's fine. All right. I thought maybe there was some superimposed screen because it said you can now see my application. I don't know what that is. So, okay. All right. So, 
again, talking about habitat, and habitat is probably the most important thing to any animal species, probably to us as well. Um, you can see where the uh, where the good habitat and poor habitat is. Obviously, down in Fairfield County along the shore of the coast, there pretty bad habitat. You know, big highways, tons of buildings. So you know, they're not going to like settle there that much. And as you go up in the middle of the state, that's the Connecticut River Valley, you know, again, interstates uh, and uh, a lot of population along those rivers. Uh, northwest corner has always been traditionally, you know, the hotbed of the black bears. Uh, but as I said, they are moving out your way and uh, you do have red and uh, you have poor and fair habitat, but just north and uh, east of you, you the better habitat picks up. Uh, so that's very important in bears, unless they're given artificial food, they'll move to where, you know, the food is for them. Uh, this is a typical look of, a, of our black bears. Uh, they have that tan face, dark eyes. Uh, in my area, we have a lot of, and you'll see them, we have a lot of black bears that have like a little crest on them, almost like the moon bear, a tan crest. Um, so bears and many other animals, as I said, do they rely on healthy wetlands. They're very good swimmers. Uh, and these wetlands sustain them in the spring, summer, and fall. As you know, we have a lot of hot summers and the bears do tend to get in the water. I happen to have an open cooler in my yard and it, we had a big rain and it got water in it. And this uh, tiny cub uh, hopped in <laughs> into the cooler like its own little hot tub. I was afraid it was going to get stuck in there, but it, it got itself out. So, um, uh, so uh, they do have, their fur was very sought after in colonial days because it's very insulating. Uh, but in the summer, it can be very hot, as I said. In the summer, oftentimes you can find them wallowing in mud holes, swimming across lakes or wading in streams uh, during that hot weather. So what do black bears eat? They're forest animals, although they're now appearing in less forested areas of the state. Uh, I've had, I'm on a bear path from the forest to the reservoirs here in, in my town. And this year, more than I've ever seen, the bears are grazing on my grass. Now I don't fertilize my grass. And I encourage you never to use fertilizers, it's bad. My grass is very green and I don't fertilize it. Uh, but this year, the skunk cabbage, which is one of the first things they like to eat when they get out of their dens, has not been coming up until the last week and a half. So they, they have to find alternate food sources. <clears throat> and since they're omnivores, which means they eat you know, plants, berries, vegetables, grass, and, but they'll also eat some meat. Uh, right now, they're really hungry and looking for things. Uh, they do get in trouble this time of year because of bird feeders. We encourage everybody to bring their bird feeders in at the end of March because the birds don't need them, the animals don't need them, and then put them back out at the end of November. Um, but our forests do generally, once everything starts blooming, provide all of our wildlife species with abundant food. Uh, but in the spring, it can be very sparse. So, uh, we do have some fawns taken by bears. A lot of hunters will tell you that the bears are eating every single fawn, and that's absolutely not true. It's uh, the exception rather than the rule. But if a mother's left her fawn and a black bear happens along, they might eat it early spring, but they don't chase down animals like a grizzly might, but they do eat carrion and dead stuff. Uh, they will often take uh, domestic goats and chickens. So. And we encourage anybody who has domestic goats and chickens to call us and we'll tell you the best way to protect them. And generally it includes hot wire, electric wire, and that works pretty much absolutely. Um, they do claw, uh, claw at rotten trees and fallen logs for insects. And you can see this a lot in the spring, even all throughout the uh, year. Uh, again, as I said, the wetlands are important. That's where they find skunk cabbage and other plants these uh, rotted uh, logs, um, they're strong and they can flip boulders over and get the insect with their single paw and get the insects underneath. So they're very opportunistic. They're kind of goat-like, they'll eat almost anything. But when their favorite early food appears, they're happy bears. They do love skunk cabbage. 
And generally it's very abundant in our forests and swamps. As I've said, I've seen it really sprouting up over the last week. It sometimes is confused with a plant called false herbivore. They're both kind of lettuce looking out in the woods. Uh, here you can see it along a stream. Uh, and here's what it looks like. There's a bear claw, the leaf there. But here's what the little fruit's like. Uh, very tasty, but very smelly. That's the name. I have smelled the bear uh, after it's eaten it, and it is pretty rank smell. They love berries. So up on Bear Mountain in Connecticut in like late July, there's acres and acres and acres of blueberries. And that's a crossing for the Appalachian Trail hikers. But so they're probably grabbing blueberries and they're probably scaring some bears because a lot of bears will just sit down in a field of blueberries and just eat and eat and eat. Uh, and they love all kinds of berries. But they also have a sweet tooth and love honey like someone else we know. So they get in trouble often with beekeepers. This, this is a very badly protected uh, beekeeping uh, location right here. This is state of the art. They are using solar, you know, for their electric fencing, uh, probably costs something, but in the long run, it does save uh, their hives. And this is what happened to the other one. A bear came through, wanted to eat the honey, possibly the bees and just totally destroyed uh, that. So what happens to that bear? Well, the bear's only doing what bears do. And Deep does recommend that if you're going to have anything, any agriculture, you need to protect it. And uh, so the vial just came out. They tranquilized the bear. They And once they tranquilize a the bear, they weigh it. They measure its ears, its claws, everything about it, take DNA sampling. Uh, and then uh, put tags on it. They, there's an urban myth that if a bear has one tag, it was in trouble once. If it has two tags, it was in trouble twice. If it has three tags, it's gonna be put down. That's totally not true. Bears are very, very rugged animals. And unlike cattle, which you put two tags on, they have claws and they can pull these things out. And they also scuffle with each other and they also run through brush. So two tags are put on hoping that at least one will stay. Uh, so then this bear will, they'll wait around until the bear comes out of being tranquilized and they'll haze it by shooting its rear end with paintball guns and making all kinds of noise, hoping it doesn't return to the area. It's not relocated. We do not relocate bears unless they're like right in the middle of downtown Hartford or something. You know. So once a bear is tasting hu human food, it won't eat wild food anymore. That's what people think. Absolutely untrue. They do prefer wild natural food. That's crab apple there, except for when it's difficult to find. And human food and bird seed is really easy to get, and they tend to be kind of lazy. So uh, they do like human garbage and bird seed. Uh, there is a uh, trash company in my area called Payne's now that does sell uh, bear proof uh, trash cans and it really has helped a lot up here in my area. Um, I love this quote, the creation of a thousand forests is in one acre and that's very true for bears. Uh, they uh, eat mast in the fall, which is a bunch of nuts is what mast is called. And uh, in the, from August until they go into hibernation, they must eat 20 to 30,000 calories a day. That's the equivalent of 35 Big Macs to get enough fat stored up for hibernation. Uh, this is a picture of a female that regularly comes through my yard. There she is on the left in August, and there she is on the right in November, and that's how much she has increased her size to get ready for hibernation. Or I can't remember if this was a uh, cub year for her, uh, but we'll talk about they have a delayed implantation, but this shows you that she uh, got pretty good food. And here's the same bear in a different year in July and September. So working very hard at eating a lot of calories. Uh, so here's uh, bear biology for black bears. Um, the males can be up to 600 pounds, although that would be kind of exceptional. Uh, this was a black bear in the back part of my yard. This was probably between 500 and 600 pounds, very big bear. Uh, but on average, our, black, our males are probably up to around 400. 
the sows up to 300 pounds. We have gotten some sows at, at the end of den season that have weighed almost 270, which is kind of surprising, but uh, that meant they had a very good year. As you know, the last few years, there's been a lot of acorns out. And in the fall, you can oftentimes find them just sitting under like oak trees, just shoveling in the acorns and not moving around much. So uh, this time of year, uh, between um, May and it all varies by bear. In July, it'll be when the sows will send their yearlings packing. And at that point, uh, uh, the, the uh, yearlings are about 16 to 17 months old and they have to fend for themselves. And a lot of times, particularly young male yearlings, because the female, the sow will not allow their male offspring to stay in their territory, but they will allow their female offspring. So a lot of these little bears aren't sure how to feed themselves. So of course they're eating bird seed. If they smell a pie through your window and you have a screen door, they might go in. So that's when we have a lot of trouble. Uh, <clears throat> they're six to 12 ounces when they're born and their eyes are closed and they're hairless. Uh, and five cubs is a lot. Uh, our average here in Connecticut is always laugh, but it was two and a half, but now it's moving up to we're getting a lot of bears with three cubs, which means, you know, their food sources are very healthy and, uh, you know, they're getting a lot to eat. Uh, we do have a sow in Connecticut now that's 27 years old. Uh, and she's the first sow we know of that had quadruplets. Um, she has not had, uh, bears have their cubs every other year, and she's not had uh, cubs her last two uh, years that she was able to have them, so she's probably done with that. Uh, in the wild, black bears can live up to 18 years, uh, but the record is 39, and the oldest captive black bear on record was uh, 44 when it died. So very long lived, and here in Connecticut, there's not much that's a threat to them except for humans. They're very strong. Uh, black bears will uh, rub against the tree, marking it. That's what this one's doing. Uh, very large uh, and tall when they get up. Uh, a sow again, there's, there's uh, one sow. I gave this to my mother friends for Mother's Day because it looked like the, the best protection you know, under the mother there. Uh, so here's some different photos of some Connecticut black bears. Uh, they do come out early sometimes. If it's been, you know, a less severe winter, you'll learn later they're not true hibernators. So they might smell some food and it might be kind of nice out and they'll get up and wander around, get something to eat and go back. Uh, we have uh, quite a few bears now that are denning under the, de uh, the decks of houses that have food out year round, which can be problematic if a sow is going to have cubs uh, that year. Um, so this picture on the right is a, is a mother, a sow and her yearling. So, and those on the left bottom would be first year cubs. And that's a big male on the top left. So sometimes like this year, things get a little messed up and as Shakespeare asked to hibernate or not to hibernate. Um, so I wanted to say something about, uh, the cubs with the, uh, with their yearlings. So, uh, black bears generally are solitary and the males more so than the females. Uh, so when the sow has cubs, obviously she has those cubs with her for almost 17 months, uh, and she'll nurture them through two winters in the den. Uh, but uh, the males are pretty much alone except for during mating season, uh, which would be from late May into early August. <clears throat> so uh, several weeks before the bears enter their den, their body system just sort of automatically starts slowing down, obviously because they're taking in a lot of calories too. Uh, their blood circulation slows. They start to eat less and, and uh, they have to go to the bathroom less. Uh, they also, they kind of come in a sleepwalking state uh, and they'll sit and lie around more frequently and for longer periods of time. This is what this sow was doing. It was late November snowstorm a few years back and she was in that sleepwalking state and she just sat there and got snowed on and it's like, what are you doing? So anyway, for hibernation sows with cubs, uh, like the, this year's cubs will enter their dens first and, uh, then sows with the yearlings, 
uh, then sows without cubs, and then lastly, the males. Uh, fat bears do enter before the uh, thin bears because their systems tell them they've had enough nutrient to survive. Um, the black bears are too large to really achieve the radical temperature change of hibernating small animals like uh, chipmunks, uh, but they do decrease their body temperature by seven to eight degrees and their metabolism drops 50 to 60 percent. Their heart rate slows from 40 to 50 beats per minute, from 40 to 50 to 8 to 19. So, um, so this is called a state of torpor. So it's not hibernation. And as I said, uh, they are, they can wake up and they can leave. Like if a, if a sow has new cubs and all of a sudden there's some huge threat to, to her, uh, she can wake up and, uh, and deal with that situation. So here again, the snow just keeps falling and this bear just stayed and stayed. And obviously, as I told you, their fur is one of the warmest and, and densest uh, in the uh, animal kingdom and it does dry very fast. So this down here, you'll see that little hole that was actually a den. Uh, you'll be surprised at how uh, our black bears den. Uh, Disney would lead you to believe that all black bears den in the cave. Well, that's not true. Uh, we do have black bears that den in cave-like settings, but more, more often than not, they're under downed trees and things like that. You will see this. Uh, this is kind of hard to see, but this is a this is a this is a bear, not a female. I we th I think it's a male, but it's just gonna make itself a little den underneath this rock. So you'll see it's brushing. They'll take all this debris of leaves, litter and pull it inside there to give themselves like a little nest. Obviously right now it's uh, aware of the camera, looking around, smelling. This was in a condo area, so there's probably just a lot of things for it to smell. Uh, I think the next one shows, so then it'll go back to its uh, raking of the leaves. Uh, this other one, I think it's a little more active doing that. You can see it's pulling the leaves in. You can see it is in there now. It's a little later. So just getting all that leaf debris in there so it can have a cushy place to rest. And they do get covered with ticks, but the ticks don't really seem to bother them. They'll scratch themselves a lot, but... Uh, Sweet trees, Miss Gieringa. Dobry vecher. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the person who took the video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... Again, um, our black bears traditionally would start pretty much going in after Thanksgiving uh, into early December and stay in their dens until mid to late March, depending on how severe the winter was uh, and whether they got enough to eat prior. Uh, you can see this is a den of, uh, behind some logs with some mountain laurel. Uh, now they're going in a little later because we're having milder winters. Um, Again, the, uh, they are not true hibernators, and the true hibernators we have are like garter snakes, chipmunks, wood frogs, turtles. Uh, the average hibernating animal weighs about seven pounds, uh, and, but the bears do go into that state of torpor where they are sleeping uh, and their metabolism is, uh, is less. Um, so they're one of the few large animals that do go into this sense of torpor. Uh, so while they're in the den, they don't have to urinate, they don't have to eat, drink, or defecate. Um, they breathe once every 45 seconds and drop their heart rate, as I said, to almost 19 beats a minute. So, so this is what we call a slash pile. This is like a typical, uh, Connecticut bear den. This could be behind your yard. I mean, they just pick these places and they make a little nest in there, whether they have cubs or not. And um, here's another one. You can see just fallen logs and they just kind of go inside there. Um, this is kind of an old chart, but it's still fairly true. Uh, although I think the rock dens have moved up a little bit. Uh, so slash pile is still our most popular a lot of down trees where I live this year and the, sometimes those big old down trees will crisscross each other and then the bears will make a den right under that. 
so pretty interesting. Uh, <clears throat> this is what we call slash piled in. So there is a bear in there. Uh, I don't think you can see my cursor, but it's right in that area. Um, here's another one. You can see the biologist there. They've located the bear. We have um, 25 sows collared with GPS units in Connecticut. Most of them are in the northwest part of the state. They're part of a study to see about uh, mortality rates, uh, breeding, and how many cubs are being born. Uh, so they're able to uh, track these bears uh, and find them in their dens. And they'll start in late January trying to find the yearling dens and hoping to tag the yearlings because they do not tag the newborn cubs. They do microchip them, which is called a pit, pit tag. But most of the time, the yearlings run away, you know, and they don't get them. But this, this thing in his hand is what is called a jab stick, and it has a tranquilizer needle on the end of it. Uh, they're very, very careful with the animals. They tranquilize, and the animals do come out of it. The biologists do hang around, particularly if uh, one of the bears has um, cubs or is in an area that might prove dangerous, and they wait to make sure you know, that they have awakened and can take care of themselves. This is our most unusual den ever. This is kind of behind my house. This is a marsh. And that's actually a black bear on top of those Phragmites. And she has cubs there. So that was a pretty unusual den. Uh, <clears throat> here's a black bear that denned under somebody's deck where the people kept uh, bird seed out all the time. Here's a den in the hollow of a tree. So the biologist had to climb down to get in there and tranquilize the mother. Uh, I read in, uh, of these biologists in New Hampshire, they had a similar situation. So they cut a door in the bottom of the tree and they went in and processed the bears and they put the piece of wood that they had cut back, back in the tree and left it as is. So there's a rock den, as you can see, Very sometimes those holes are so small Two years ago, one of our bear biologists, Melissa Rushik, who's just an amazing uh, uh, person that has this innate ability to find animals, uh, they couldn't reach the sow's collar and they had to change it because the batteries were going bad. So she like hung upside down <laughs> with her dangling into the cave to be able to take off the, uh, uh, the collar. Um, so here's another den out in the southwest, again, a fallen tree that's hollow. Uh, the cubs are born in January after a gestation of about seven months. Uh, the mating generally occurs, as I said, in the summer, uh, but uh, the fetal development takes place uh, in the last two months of pregnancy uh, when the egg implants in the uterus and it will not implant, and this is called delayed implantation, if the bear has had, not had enough uh, food and their body automatically can tell if there's enough fat reserve uh, to sustain a pregnancy. And if not, uh, it will never implant. Um, and again, these fetuses will only develop if she has enough body fat and other nutrients to survive the winter. Um, during hibernation, or it, it, it's called hibernation, but it's basically torpor. They lose about a half a pound per day and up to a third of their weight by the time they come back out in the spring. Uh, the sows generally lose more weight, although we've been seeing that they haven't so much because we think there's just been so much food that they're eating in the fall. Um, we had one uh, bear you'll see pictures of later that uh, weighed 273 pounds and she had two cubs. So <laughs> when we came to her den in late February, so quite a marvelous. Uh, Again, they weigh less than a pound when they're born. Uh, they only have a very light covering of fur. They can't crawl, they can't see. Uh, so uh, the mother has to lick the cubs when they're born to keep them warm and uh, put them against her belly, which is usually has thinner fur at that point. Uh, she has to be very careful because she's very big and she's kind of in a sleeping state. So she doesn't roll over onto them and she, moves in response to their cries and, and noises they make. Um, so once she's had the cubs, she's pretty much awake, kind of snoozing a little, uh, but she will lose 15 to 25% generally of her body weight. Uh, by the time they come out of their dens, which is generally you know around late April, May, 
Uh, they'll be two to three months of age, weigh about four to six pounds, depending on how much milk their mothers had. Uh, again, here's another den there. Uh, this is a den that one uh, bear in my area, she doesn't even get covered up. She's one of her dens was under a mountain laurel bush. And so they obviously get snowed on. But as you can see, she has a little nest in front of her where her cubs would be. There's the bear in the middle there. You can see like a little white uh, dot. That's her collar. So again, that's just a, all kinds of fallen, fallen trees. And here she is. She's tranquilized here, but that's basically her den right there. So again, in late February and March, the biologists go out to find the sows with the yearlings and then the sows with the newborn cubs. Uh, they process uh, all of them. Uh, they put, as I said, microchips, which are called pit tags in the wildlife world on the cubs and they'll measure everything about the cubs. You'll see a picture in a minute. They put them in a little bag to weigh them. Uh, they'll process the mother, they weigh her, uh, just see about the health of everything. They always have a biologist nearby with a dart gun in case the jab stick, uh, they have to guess the weight of the bear and if they don't guess it right and the bear goes out and is staggering around, you know, look at this, look at the angle here that's on the side of a hill. They don't want the bear to get hurt. So they would uh, tranquilize it with another dart just to be sure it doesn't run off and hurt itself. Uh, so there was a bear under there and you can say, how the heck does a bear get under there? Uh, again, here's the jab stick. So they have to find just the right spot, usually kind of in the shoulder or rump uh, to put put the stick and then wait, uh, you know, amount of time. This is Melissa Rushak, who I said is so amazing at finding animals in the woods. Here's a cub with uh, our head biologist, Jason Hawley. Um, and here's how they weigh the, the bear, the big bears. And I'll tell you, they get those 500, 600 pound bears. These guys have to lift them up with this stick and it has like a little scale on it. And that's how they tell how much the bear's way. Here's newborn cubs. You know, they would have been born in January. This would have been in late February, early March. Uh, you can see they already have very long claws. They can almost climb trees right out of the, uh, the den, uh, except sometimes some of them are a little afraid to do it, uh, but they will. Uh, this is that bear that I 27 now, and those are her quadruplets. She was a pretty big bear. Um, here they are a little and when they come out of their den and they're not with their mother, some of them will make a lot of mewing sounds and really scream for their mother and don't understand why she's not responding. But mostly they want to stay warm because they've been under this warm fur body for, you know, a couple of months. And so they'll oftentimes try to get inside the coat of the biologist just to stay warm and they don't really claw, uh, you know, they just want to be warm. They really want their mother, but you know she's not available at the time. So this is one in my area that's uh, uh, been around a long time. She's probably the, the queen, we call her the queen of the forest because no bear messes with her. And she is just a fearless uh, defender of her cubs. Uh, she's 17 right now. Uh, this, this den, uh, this year she only had one cub, which is unusual for her. Now she could have lost one, you know, a child, you know, when she had them, we, we don't have any way of knowing that, but uh, you can see this little cub wasn't real happy. Look at those long claws and little feet. Uh, so here's her den this year. You can see it's just like in a crook of some fallen trees. Uh, there's a little bag, this little, this little uh, female didn't want to go in the bag because usually they just put them in their bag with their head popping out and they have a weight on the bag and it tells you how heavy, but this one was squirming like crazy. So Jason zipped it in real quick. <laughs> it was very quick, but just to get this little uh, cub's weight. So then it's put back with the mother who's tranquilized and they'll hang around to make sure. Now, it's not really true that if you touch an animal, like their mother's gonna reject them, whether it's a bird or a deer or a bear, but just to try to ease the mother coming out of uh, being tranquilized, they will put vas uh, Vaseline, uh, I'm sorry, Vicks, uh, Vaseline on their nose. 
and they'll put Vaseline on the little cub a little bit. Uh, but it's probably not necessary, but they just do this because they know she'll be in a woozy state uh, when she awakens. Um, this is that same bear, little mama with her, her yearling cubs. Uh, again, there's her, there she is, and the little bears are standing up to see. One morning I woke up to go to work. I have a big Norway spruce, which has been a bear tree, I've been told by two previous owners that there's always bears coming through and using that tree for safety. Uh, sh the, the bears also sent, there's, they have certain trees in their territory where they, they're like safety trees. So if they wanna send their cubs up and say she wants to forage and wants them just to go to sleep and out of the way, they have certain trees and this is one of them. But I woke up one morning and looked out and she was nursing uh, these three cubs. So that was pretty uh, spectacular. Uh, people say don't get between a bear and their cubs. That's definitely true with uh, grizzlies. But with black bears, what they do is they send their cubs up a tree almost immediately. Uh, there was a case this uh, winter when Melissa went out in a, in a big snowstorm to find this one other bear that the other biologists couldn't find. And she came upon this huge rock area and she just had a sense that the bear was underneath in this little rock opening and she was about 12 feet up. So she got her glove and tied a rope on it and dangled it into the hole to see if anything batted at it. So nothing batted at it. So then she tied her phone to a rope, put it down there and was able to see that there was the, the female bear and at least one yearling. She was supposed to have three, but she couldn't determine if there were others. So because she wanted to get a count of the yearlings, uh, she just got a stick and kind of wrapped it on the rock. And the three yearlings left the safety of their mother, ran out and went up a tree because what they've been taught is that if there's danger, you go up a tree that's safe, more safe for you than even the mother. And the mother didn't go out because she's like, hey, it's snowing, it's windy out. I'm not going out there. And these are yearlings. They can take care of themselves. So uh, again, here she has heard something and she starts to send the cubs up a tree. Incidentally, that's the old style GPS collar. Now the collars are like a third that size. They're not as big anymore. And they will pinpoint, the new ones can pinpoint where the bear is like every nine hours. Uh, so this is called a bear can. So if they need to catch a bear for any reason, that's part of the Bar Kempstead Reservoir in the background. They'll put donuts inside there hanging on in this cage. And the, and the bear goes in, pulls on the donuts and the gate shuts. Uh, they're mostly okay in there because they got donuts to eat and the biologists come really quickly. They have cameras on the traps and they get there quickly. But uh, this is that one little mama and she knows not to go in those cans anymore. So Paul Rigo, who was with Deep for almost 40 years, he just retired, which will be a big loss because he was a real expert on wildlife. Uh, but here they are processing some bears. Here's a bear in a can. Um, here's the tagging system. It used to be they would just get the first bear collar, you know, uh, and it would be uh, in the year, say, was 2012, so it would be one, two, but now it's it's a little more difficult. Uh, so now they use the first two digits, 01, and the third digit is the year. Uh, so 124 is the 12th bear handled in 2014. So uh, that's the calling system now. I mean, sorry, the tagging system. So here's a, another bear, uh, first handled in 2010, she's 13. Uh, she is the offspring of little mama and she does, uh, she did stay in her area until they kind of had a squabble in mating season over a couple of male bears and little mama chased her up a tree. And after that, Scruffy went across the Farmington River from there. But she's uh, had two cubs this year and a total of 12. Uh, I called her the peeking bear because she'd always peek around trees. So she was quite animated. She was the one with her cub there. Uh, and then the last one that's also in a study in this area that I see quite frequently, she was a cub in 2009, uh, collared in 2013. She's 14 now. 
Uh, she has uh, three cubs now. They're all females. They're smaller than most yearlings. Her total cubs are 12. So pretty, pretty healthy group. We have about a 70 to 75% survival rate of cubs in their first year. Generally, if they die, they're uh, hit by a car or possibly poached. Um, so I want to show you this is the sometimes cubs have really interesting behavior. I have sometimes I put balls out to see if they play one, with them and they do. Uh, but this one was uh, we called the acrobat. So you watch. So the mother is off to the right. You can't see her and she's eating grass. So the little cubs bored. It's the middle of the summer. And normally they go up the trunk and down the trunk, but here's how this one uh, decided to come down. And then it did it time and time again for weeks. Watch it when it thuds and runs back to the trunk. <laughs> And there it goes. So I did this this particular day about four or five times. And then finally something, the mother uh, heard something that alarmed her and the cub was up the tree on that, those branches again, but she, she kind of huffed and the cub ran right to the trunk and came down and they left. So uh, pretty interesting behavior. Uh, so this is one of her offspring. And you can see that patch I was talking about. This actual bear, uh, ended up with a, that tan patch on his chest uh, almost became a perfect heart when he got bigger. So just to show you what the GPS collars can do, uh, the red is that bear I call the Peking Bear Scruffy. So that's the Farmington River in the middle there, the west branch of the Farmington River. And she used to be over, uh, you know, on the other side, but again, she and little mama had some kind of a difference. And now Scruffy pretty much is in what we call American Legion State Forest. And then the green is uh, Jekyll, who had another name at one point because they had the number system wrong. And the purple would be little mama. You can see she stays in a little more, uh, she has her domain. She stays in a tighter area. The females territories are 10 miles or less usually more like five, whereas the males can range 50, 60 miles. Now, the bears do migrate oftentimes in the fall for a short time. Uh, there's a cranberry bog over the line in Massachusetts off Route 8, and uh, that little mama has gone up there to eat the cranberries, and, you know, that's quite a ways, but always comes back to their areas to den. So signs of black bear, uh, bear walk on the soles of their feet. Uh, so they don't often, sometimes they don't leave the steep tracks unless they're in mud or snow. But obviously we have no tracks larger other than human boots. Uh, they have five toes in each foot. Their large toes on the outside of the foot and the small inner toe doesn't always show in their tracks. Uh, they have really uh, thick uh, foot pads, which are bigger at the outer edges. Uh, their front tracks are wider than the rear, so you can see that's the rear track that's in front there on the left. Um, the small round hill pad at the front uh, uh, seldom shows. Uh, they tend to walk kind of pigeon-toed. You know, they have a very distinct walk, uh, especially with their front feet. Uh, oftentimes, uh, bears and other animals travel in what we call an overstep walk or a direct register, which means the back foot falls only slightly in front of the front foot and it makes like a double track. So if people are trying to learn tracking, this makes it difficult. Uh, and in deep snow, they really do this by placing their rear, rear foot in the same hole created by the front foot, much like we probably all do when we're trying to walk in snow to try to go in the prints of somebody else. Uh, bears will claw trees up. Another way, if you're in the woods trying to see if there's any bear sign, they do claw at trees as well as logs. As I told you, they will bite trees and do all kinds of things uh, to trees. Here's some snow tracks I've gotten in the winters. Uh, if you have kids or grandkids, winter is a great time right after the snow to go out and see what's been there. 
Uh, here's some tracks of a bear I was following into the woods. It came out at night and uh, pretty easy to track in the snow. So uh, again, there's that overstep motion uh, where the hind foot is way in front of the front. Uh, and when you're looking for signs of animals, you look at what is called scat or their poop and you can tell what they've been eating. And a lot of times you'll see sunflower seeds, but here it looks like pretty much natural stuff this one was eating. Uh, so a few myth of realities, bears are unpredictable. Uh, not so much. Uh, they do use body language and vocalizations. They have that false charge I told you about where they'll slap their front paws and then lunge about a foot a yard to let you know they're not too comfortable. If they really get afraid, they'll kind of do huff, puff, hiss, and click their teeth. Black bears don't really growl. They have kind of a, like a groaning, but it's not really a growl. Uh, and again, standing on their hind legs, it's not about the charge. Now this, my friend of mine from California sent me this and I said, come on, that's a man in a bear suit and it really is a black bear. And you will see in different regions, some of the bears look a little different. So it's just trying to see what, what's there. Uh, sniffing is very, this is a very uh, uh, well-known profile of a bear. Uh, they smell 200 times that of us and eight times that of uh, one hound. So, uh, very, very sharp sense of smell. I'll tell you an incident that happened to me recently. Uh, I have a neighbor that she likes to scatter out. She knows you're not supposed to put bird seed out now. And she likes to scatter just a little couple of handfuls of sunflower seed in the morning. And the bears were grazing in my back, back of my yard. So they were 400 yards at least from her house, a road, and they were behind my house, so not inside of her house. And all of a sudden, the three little yearlings were eating, and all of a sudden, the mother looks up, runs over towards the big tree where the yearlings are. They all look up, and then she runs across the street immediately. So she had no way of knowing that my neighbor had, and I called my neighbor just to tell her, hey, the bears are coming to your house if you want to see them. But then she said, oh, no, I just put seed out. And that made me realize that that sense of smell is uncanny because there was no noise made. It was simply the uncanny sense of smell of the bear. And that really illustrated it quite uh, well. If a bear charges you climb a tree, nope, they can climb much better than you. Uh, despite being timid on the ground, they're very accomplished climbers and they're can be courageous and they will fight things in trees. Uh, they will sleep there sometimes, especially when it's really hot. Uh, this is that incident I said where that little mama ch chased Scruffy and after that, uh, the one on the right <laughs> pretty much went across the river. Uh, again, if a sow feels threatened, she sends her cubs up a tree. When you see a bear, you should hightail it and run. Never, not with any kind of bear. You shouldn't turn your back on them. Uh, this is on my road. Uh, this bicyclist came along and saw a bear, so he did the right thing. He just stopped and waited for the bear to go on across. Uh, if you see a bear, you just look in the direction of it, talk, you can talk to it, let it pass. If it doesn't walk away, you can slowly uh, back away talking at it. Uh, if it moves towards you, you need to raise your arms, appear really large, even do jumping jacks. If it keeps coming closer and closer, which some real curious yearlings might do, then just start throwing things at it. And then 99.9% .9 of the bears are gone. You know what I mean? Uh, there's rogue bears like there are rogue people, probably a much less percentage of rogue bears, but uh, generally speaking, all this stuff will make them leave. Uh, if you're nervous about hiking, you know, there are bears around, uh, you can car carry pepper spray. You know, bear spray is not really necessary for black bears. Uh, I carry bear spray because I hike alone a lot in areas I don't know. And I carry it not for animals, but for the random bad person that might try to hurt me. Because it does shoot, shoot like 30 feet. <laughs> so I couldn't resist this sign. So uh, anyway, uh, in most cases, they'll run away. So never ever let your dog off leash when you see a, any kind of a wild animal. Keep it on the leash right with you. Uh, make noise. Some people like out west, like everybody's like, 
oh, that tiny bell is not going to scare a, you know, not going to scare a grizzly. No, it's not really going to square scare a grizzly, but the grizzly's going to hear the bell, and that noise uh, lets the grizzly know there's something in the area. So it's not a case of coming around the corner and being nose to nose with the grizzly. So in a sense, it's just kind of an alert. Um, so if you camp, you need to use a bear container um, and never run uh, to feed or not to feed. Uh, we encourage uh, you to, we say, yeah, put the bird seed out when it's needed, when the winter's severe and there are birds and other animals might need it. But late March, please bring it in and don't put it out again until late November. There are a lot of towns near where I live coming up with ordinances some are preventing bird seed feeding at all, and some are uh, preventing if, if you feeding birds brings black bears to your yard and they become a nuisance, then you can be warned and then fined. So that may eventually be a state statute. Uh, so bears will come out, as I said, in the winter, because if, you know, they just do, generally it'll be the males more than the females. Uh, but in the spring, when they come out, it's every bear for him or herself. They're cranky. They haven't eaten. They're hungry. Uh, so that's when they might break into uh, chicken coops or into uh, cages. Uh, this is an old uh, bird feeder I never used, but it still has scent from 16 years ago. So I finally took it down, but the bear was thinking something was there. Uh, they eat garbage. No, they won't peel the paper away. They eat everything. Uh, they'll really make a mess. And you can see on the, on the right side, that little bear is just taking something that looks like uh, aluminum foil. Again, the feet are not, they are, are omnivorous, what I said. So hyperphagia is what the state they get in in the fall uh, when they're feeding. And that's when they get into that sleepwalking state. Uh, but during the normal seasons, they need to consume about 5,000 calories per day. And this will include 80% plants, 15% insects, grubs, things like that, and 5% animal matter, which might be alive or not alive. Um, they're kind of lazy. They can run up to 35 miles per hour. They're good swimmers. They can swim across a whole lake. Uh, but they, they choose food that's abundant, easy to handle, and readily available. So even though this is in a feeder, that's nothing to a bear. He'll yank it down and get in it in a second. But the problem is it teaches their young to do the same. And what happens, a fed bear is generally sometimes a dead bear because it gets bad habits. If a bear breaks into a house, if they're caught, they'll be put down. Uh, so see here's it's a, everybody laughs and said oh that's a cute photo it's cute but yeah this mother has been teaching them it's okay to come in this yard and, and eat this food uh, they'll get up against your windows uh, and become nuisance bears and then oftentimes might have to end up being euthanized which really 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 breaks the hearts of the wildlife biologists but sometimes they have no choice so I want to tell you about the pie-eating bear in my, in my town. So this bear is coming out. It had just been in that kitchen. Those steps lead up to a kitchen. So this woman had baked a pie, left her window open where just the screen was open, drove to the store. So this young bear smelled that pie, walked up those steps, went into that window. And inside, there was a little dog yapping. That's how these photos were taken because the neighbors heard the dog. And so this bear ate the whole pie ate all the peels in the sink and didn't even pay any attention to the dog. Then came back out the window. There you can see the screen against his face and then took off. So if, if you're in an area where you know there's bears, pull your windows down when you cook something good. If you grill, you should always, even for other wild animals, you should clean that drip pan and clean off your grill. Uh, because even other animals, coyotes and everything, will come around if they smell food. It's not often a bear steals an iPhone, but it's happened. Uh, there are times when you report a bear. We ask you to report them for a sighting that you've just seen one. But if there is a nuisance bear, uh, you need to be reported because there may be a situation like some um, condo places have 
leave their big uh, dumpsters open. You know, that's not a good practice. So then Deep would go over and tell them, please, you know, pull the bar. Otherwise, excuse me, you're going to have trouble, you know, with bears. So we all have to do our part to help out. So this bear, uh, that was a, a bird feeder that was empty, but it had been used in the winter. So this bear was trying to go up this dogwood tree to get to the, to the feed, but it couldn't make it. Uh, here, you wouldn't report these bears other than the sighting. Oh, I saw a mom, you know, with three cubs. So they like to have that information, that data and where you saw them. Uh, would you report that? Probably, because I can tell you having grown up on a ranch, this little bear is going to get some big hurt from that cow because a cow can has swivel hicks and can cook a kick about six ways. So that bear is not going to fare so well. So uh, the bears are in our midst. Uh, we have a population, a healthy population of probably around 1,200, which is nowhere near our carrying capacity yet. Uh, they're rarely aggressive, but if they get habituated with food, then they expect that food. They'll come back and expect it to be there. And if it's not, they might go on your deck. And if they do, I recommend putting coins in a metal coffee can and shake it because an air horn sounds like a car horn, but most of them have never heard can, you know, coins shaken in a can and it'll scare all kinds of critters off. Uh, including coyotes and other things. So, uh, so here's humans to blame here. Obviously, this bear's climbing over to get to the food, and sometimes the decks break when they climb if they're big enough. Um, so again, a bear encountered. This was a horrible thing. Simsbury has written. This is in Simsbury. They've written the most uh, strong bear ordinance. They don't allow bird feeding at all from. Uh, Early, late March until mid-November, and you'll get fined if you're caught because they had such a problem with uh, bird feeders in every yard and a lot of bears coming into their town. And you never go up to a bear like this to take a photo. This guy just, uh, even though I say they're pretty timid, I mean, you, you know, it's a big wild animal. So again, this father took his son out to take a picture of a yearling bear not a wise thing. And here these hikers are running. They shouldn't have run. Uh, this guy's doing the right thing. He notices a bear going to the water. So this hiker just waited and then the bear had his drink and went on. Uh, so if you're a bird lover, uh, obviously you like to see birds. I encourage you also to go on the DEP website or the Master Gardener program and look up Connecticut native plants because there's a lot more native plants that'll bring you a lot more variety of bird species than any seed will. And, uh, you know, that way you can save your money for feeding in the winter. Uh, so, you know, if you feed, you're going to have a lot of birds. But again, as I said, and as all the specialists say, there are a lot of flowering native plants that will bring tons of hummingbirds, uh, pollinators, uh, all those special birds you want to see. The cons are you're going to have all these animals looking around, hanging around, raccoons congregate in numbers and they are a vector for rabies more than any of our other animal species. Um, so again, uh, stop feeding birds. Uh, that's changed a little because our bears are out later. So from early April till late November, uh, please don't put your garbage out till day of pickup. Uh, lock your windows and doors when you leave home, but, and even your car doors, because bears can open these things. Uh, clean your grill. Uh, if you do this, um, I know somebody who built a, a basketball pole in concrete and would put their feet, you know, the bird feeder way up there, and it does make it hard for the bear. So uh, you really should always keep the ground beneath your feeders clean because it can bring uh, bacteria and germs. Uh, so if you insist on feeding, uh, they, bears don't like safflower seed or niger. You can put cayenne pepper in it, and apparently it doesn't bother the birds. Um, uh, so bring in the feeders at night. Water doesn't work. They like the water. So <laughs> sensor lights, they get used to those now. Uh, keep your fences a good repair, but they can climb fences. Um, so they are opportunistic and they will try to get food. So 
you can see during 2019 and 2020, the orange is 2019, look at the incidence of how much bear home entries jumped, uh, quite spectacular. Uh, so again, it's just uh, really bad human habits more than bears, uh, bad habits. Uh, so if you're camping, remember that your toothpaste has sugar in it and it smells good to bears. And if you cooked a lot of food and you have popcorn on your clothes, you should also hang those clothes because they smell like food to the bear and you might have this bear peeking in. Um, here's kind of an ideal area for, um, you know, if you're in an area with bear. Uh, a lot of places, campgrounds have bear boxes now where you can secure your food. Um, despite doubts among a lot of hikers and campers, uh, you are better off with an eight ounce can of bear spray than a gun. And uh, there's been a 20 year study with guides and other people and found that people, that bear spray works much more accurately because it sprays 30 feet. It goes out in a, into a cloud and will stop a grizzly for 20 to 25 minutes. And if you're trying to use a pistol, the likelihood, even if you're a good shot, you're gonna hit a, a bear in a spot that's gonna stop them is not very good. So even guides uh, uh, are, are finding that using bear spray is more effective than a gun. So I have to always throw a funny cartoon in it. This is what bear spray looks like and you better practice and know how to use it. A lot of people shoot it into the wind, not a good idea. So here's just, I think they're magnificent creatures. Here's some young cubs. Uh, I put a ball in my yard and this one actually picked it up and my friends accused me of photoshopping, but it actually did pick that ball up. Uh, one day, uh, I, that ball was in my yard all winter and one morning I noticed it was gone uh, in like March. And then the next day I had a basketball in my yard and then that, le that was gone. And then two days later I had a deflated soccer ball. So animals, bobcat, even little fox, little animals do play with our kids yard toys. So again, they look up, they're very curious. I finally got my bear dancing shot, but actually these were two cubs that were just tussling with each other. And this is the biggest bear I've ever seen. I couldn't guess, but it's gotta be over 600 pounds. Uh, and there's a one, when they put their tongues out, I always thought they were really like too hot, but they're putting out pheromones is what they're doing. So, and there's Valentino again. There's a difference in size and a male and a female bear, uh, pretty large. And they will hang around together once they kick the yearlings out. So for maybe a month, the males will be following the females and everything is on her terms, guys. Uh, so long may they live and uh, there's even bears in the sky. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh